Okay, I'm going to get started. So um, good morning, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Olson. I'm a professor in, at Columbia in the Department of Otolaryngology and also Biomedical Engineering. And today we're really excited to kick off our new research spotlight series, BME Faculty in Focus, where we're gonna highlight research conducted by our Columbia BME faculty. Moving forward, these lectures will be available on our BME YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Columbia BME. Throughout the presentation, if you have questions for our speaker, please feel free to type them into the Q&A area at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to answer as many as possible at the end of the lecture. And at this time, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our uh, inaugural BME faculty and focus speaker, Professor Ed Guo. So Dr. Guo is currently chair and Stanley Dicker Stanley Dicker Professor of Biomedical Engineering and Professor of Medical Sciences in Medicine. Dr. Guo directs the Bone Bioengineering Laboratory in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Columbia, and his research focuses on uh, micromechanics of bone tissue, computational biomechanics, and mechanobiology of bone. Dr. Guo's past honors include the Young Investigator Recognition Award from the Orthopedic Research Society, the National Research Service Award from NIH, a Career Award from the uh, US National Foundation of Science, funds for talented professionals from the National Natural Science Foundation of China, and the Christopher R. Jacobs Award from the Biomedical Engineering Society. Professor Guo was one of the founding members of the BME department at Columbia and has served as its undergraduate chair, ABET chair, vice chair, and interim chair. And he was <laughs> elected department chair in 2017. During his current tenure as chair, the department has risen to the top 10 in the country. So <laughs> welcome, Ed. Thanks so much, Ibiza. And uh, thanks so much spending the Friday afternoon with you and starting off the uh, you know, if I focus, uh, I'm very happy to uh, present uh, uh, my love, which is my home bioengineering research. So I'm going to be talking about uh, really the microstructure mechanics and also the me mechanobiology. And at the end, you can see the structure mechanics and mechanobiology, everything actually is linked. And hopefully we can also move in beyond just what I do. Uh, so you know, you probably don't think too much about it. Why do we need a skeleton? Skeleton actually is quite ancient, right? So when you have shark, shark, you know, actually have, have bones. And then uh, all the uh, species are come from the land, uh, come from the sea. And so therefore I think the evolution, when we have uh, crawling animals, have the amphibious animals and they have uh, uh, mammals, the evolution process so now, I study more bones now, I really understand is we're still in a, it's a human history, it's very short. So therefore we're still in a very long journey to overcoming the baggages we have because we're too heavy. So therefore uh, we want shedding off as much as bone as possible because when we first come to the land, you have two choices because you are uh, at risk to eat by other species. So one strategy, uh, prevailed for quite a while, but at the end, by these unplanned uh, events, they disappear, right? So that's dinosaur. So the one way to do is you grow bigger and bigger, and therefore you cannot be eaten by any, any, anybody else. And that one failed because the asteroid hit the earth. And uh, the mammals, humans, actually survived, but we took a different strategy, different strategy such that we actually try to get rid of as much bone as possible. It's very interesting in the old bone biology evolved from fish biology to mammal biology. So you create new proteins. All the proteins is either tells you do not making bones or go to remove bones. So that's very interesting. Of course, we have to, we need to have a bones because the bone really supporting our uh, every motions we have. And then, you know, this is my former student from the lab. You know, she was a dancer before. So we are interested in the bone, and then particularly in our lab, we're interested in the, 
bone microstructure and also osteoporosis, right? Showing here is actually a very nice picture of a uh, skeleton in here that's in the spine, vertebral bones. And then even by eye, you can see there are delicate structures in there, right? On the right side here, you can see piece of uh, kind of sheet of bones that look like a play-like structure. And then in the middle, you can see, you know, they have some things like single column or like a rod, that structure. So that's the feature I want to observe is they actually have kind of played rod like structure. Second one is even looks disorganized, but they do showing the axial direction and then all the bones along this way. So in osteoporosis, or when getting old, they in loss in bones. So that's most, in, most important, right? You, it's very apparent, you lost some amount of bones. You look at this aging bone, it's actually not bad, but you can see how many bones they lost. But if you observing also carefully, those play like structure all disappeared replaced by mostly this raw like structure so the consequence for example is a fractures and one type of fracture is called spine fracture actually it's silent you don't know about it so if you look at this picture of a Ch Chinese woman from Hong Kong these are three generations of uh, women and you can see the grandma actually is bent her back. And then that's actually the consequence of spine fractures. You look at the x-ray on top, you see the two top and bottom vertebrae actually is very nice square shape. And in the middle, you can see the one actually skin reduced dimension actually is quashed. So that's a spine fracture. So causing the curvature, but most importantly also can compress the spinal nerve and causing disease and also causing, you know, uh, causing uh, other cardiovascular, you know, features. Another thing we don't think about too much about bone and it's still very challenging is other disease is osteoarthritis. We don't still don't know what the cause of osteoarthritis and then the treatment is essentially unknown. More recently, we begin to understand a little bit more biology now. So on the surface, that looks like opposite what we see in osteoporosis, right? So I'll show you in the bottom, a picture in here in the middle, assuming it's normal trabeculate bone. On the left side is loss in bone in osteoporosis. And then in the end stage of osteoarthritis, or we call the OA, and you can see that you have a lot of bone. So therefore it's like a, almost like a, a lot of bones. But now from recent study, we have found out the, you know, the underlying uh, cause of uh, uh, osteoarthritis may come from actually abnormal resorptions in here. So therefore that's the deal that's standing here. But showing right in here a picture we call the end stage OA because you can see the, uh, the medium side of this uh, knee joints here is red because they don't have the shining color anymore. But it, notice on the latter side on the left, actually you can see still maintains a good color you have here. But it's so painful that is the patient's ready to do a total joint replacement. So another thing very really fascinating for a lab and for many, many people working bone is bone is live. That you're able to adapt into a, how much you use in mechanical. So we have Australia Open going on right now. This is a picture of US Open. You can see the playing arm is not only muscle-wise stronger, the bone actually is 20 to 30 pounds. 30% uh, bigger than the non-playing arm. So uh, there is a hypothesis which is very old, ancient and is more than 100 years old. It's called the Wolf's Law. Essentially, it's bone, micro, bone mass and microstructure follows the mechanical laws. And but what the underlying message is not known. And then you know we reactivate you know space uh, activities now. And of course you know in the mask is we really put a lot of uh, news into flying to space. And in space, you lost in bones, right? And then you lost in about 2% of bones per month if you stay in space. So therefore, eventually we go to Mars and then we face a tremendous problem of one year fly to Mars, you know, if you're not able creating this, uh, uh, you know, super, you know, centrifuge, centri if you will, and they're going to lose a lot of bones. And then you can see loss in 24% of bones sounds like not too bad, but the, the consequence in mechanical property bone is actually very devastating. Uh, so we are interested in bone microstructure. Fortunately, there are technology available to study this microstructure non-invasively. It's called the microcomputer tomography, um, it's CT machine, but it's just high resolution. And they can also use this one in patients, which is give them a different name. It's called a high resolution peripheral quantitative computer tomography, HRPQCT. You can see right side is a scan of the tibia. You can see, you know, kind of representing the microstructure in there. 
So as I mentioned, I'm very fascinated by microstructure, right? So I'm particularly interested not a long time ago is can we separating these nice tobacco plates and rod-like structure? And they also have a way to quantify orientation. So with the research many, many back many, many years ago now is we developed this technique is called individual tubercular segmentation called ITS. You can see if you zoom in that three dimensional image you have, you see a single rod like tubercular and then you know, it's voxel you see in here. And by this uh, segmentation technique you can see this yellow single rod like tubercular has been segmented automatically from structure. So this, this uh, segmentation is automatic, do not really need a human intervention. And uh, therefore now, you can describe the microstructure differently. So for example, we separate them into the green showing the picture in the right, that's plate. And the red is showing picture on the right is rod. So therefore you can count how many plate are in the bone. It's called plate bone volume fraction. So bone volume fraction is essentially bone volume divided by total volume. So if it's plate, we put a P in front of them. If it's rod, we'll put an R in front of them. So that's a, a new description of how much plates in there, how many rod in there. And then you can quantify now, have technique, quantify individual, each one of them, what's the orientation. So therefore you can design them, define them as a longitudinal, along the anatomic uh, uh, position, anatomic directions or transverse, you know, in, in perpendicular to the, to the, low, to, to the uh, anatomic uh, uh, directions, right? And then you can also, so, if we measure the orientation, what do we find out? That even though it looks very disorganized, but all the bones, microstructure bones, tubercular bones in your body actually are designed this way. So you can see the plate um, mostly in the longitudinal direction and the rod mostly is in the transverse direction. So therefore, the tubercular bone is designed such that the plate are lined with where the anatomic location directions or loading directions. And the rod is almost like a rebar in your building to reinforce them, right? And then you can also looking at the distribution of the thickness. And then you can also count number of plates numbers in here. So I want to look at you know, the, there's something here now. It's, you know, the total amount of plate or rod depends on two factors, right? One is individual thickness, another one is number. So therefore roughly, you know, the number times the square of thickness or so on and so forth is equal to the total bone volume. So therefore you can see that two ways you describe the bone volume factor. One is number, another one is thickness. So this may come into play later on important. So the most important thing about the tubercular bone is the mechanical property highly depends on the, uh, is that the money machine? No, okay, that's your basic. So the mechanical property plotting in here is a Young's modulus in the, in the longitudinal direction or in the axis direction and plotted on the right, the horizontal axis are three parameters. is bone warm fraction, plate bone warm fraction and axial bone warm fraction. Axial bone from A means the bone warm fraction in that direction, right? Because we're talking about E33 is in the vertical direction, for example. So you can see one thing is the, how much bone you have in there describe the mechanical property. They can range in from, you know, just 100 megapascals to 1,000, 3,000 megapascals. All depends on how much bone volume you have. And then they describe most of them, right? So R square is 0.94. Out of those bone volume fractions, you can see if we any measure the plate bone volume fraction with PBVTV in green, it actually equal describe the mechanical properties. And if we only count the bone volume fraction in the direction of the mechanical property, they almost completely describe the mechanical property. The R square is 0.99. So therefore there's not really too much variation cannot be explained by bone aligned in this direction. So therefore the mechanical property is really determined by how much those micro bones aligned in that direction. And then of course, this is a, if you look at them, they looks like plates, looks like rods, but they did not exactly place a rod. That's biology is, right? So how we actually show is actually just spongy plates and rod. So we actually can using a experimental computation way to prove it, right? So you can see on top our original micro CT images. And then, and then we can do this called ITS and then creating a, a alternative model, the plates and rods. We call them PR model, 
right? So you can see you have the, you know, you're showing the middle, those are played representation. And then biomechanically, we can also making an orange model, we call it a voxel model. So therefore, there's no assumption of plate and rod. So they are original structures in here. And then we, you know, can do experiments of sample. You can see that sample was had done the experiments and then that's in green. And then we model them. And the yellow was a voxel model, means, you know, do not make assumption of plate and rod. Another one is alternative model based on really the plate and rod segmentation. Note, in these two models, you know, called FE, finite models, and then we're using the exact same parameters. We're not cheating anything, right? So voxel model and prior model have the exact same thing. So therefore you can see, you know, in the linear version, this straight line here, they both voxel model and the PR model doing exactly the same, right? So therefore, and then if you look at when they begin to bend, that's where they begin to fail. And then you play the model, play the raw model, your model uh, a little bit better. So therefore we can confidently say by doing this experiment, the trifactory bone, biomechanically is described by play the raw structures. And getting very exciting is, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, you have this uh, uh, HRP QCD, you know, they probably have about 50 of them around the world right now. Columbia, fortunately have one, is uh, the original voxel size of 82 microns and the second generation actually 61 microns. But we actually can scan them at 43 microns as well, but in general, we don't do that. So you can see these are non-invasive, you can do on patients. And so therefore you can scan, you know, the patient's radius and uh, uh, ankle. And you can see that's a picture of me in there. I think the bone, I don't know whether this one bone is me or not, but then you can see you really can have a nice structure of this one here. So showing the application of this imaging technique as well as our ITS, you know, shown here is a example of a scan. So you can see scout view showing the tibia and uh, also radius, okay? And then you can see the normal patients, they really have a nice structures. And then in some patients that have structure, you can notice them, they have uh, changes in the trabeculable microstructure in the middle here. Definitely you lost in bones and then maybe hopefully there are also some other changes here. So it could, therefore you can also creating a patient specific model based on those images and again perform a virtual mechanical compressions and they can determine the whole bone, what's the stiffness, or you can take it out only the trabeculum compartment, look at the spongy bone and also can calculate in the stiffness well. Right, so we have done many, many studies with my collaborator, wonderful collaborator from the Columbia Medical School and the Chronology de de Department. And the one of the example here is we recruiting patients who has a postmenopausal woman with vertebral fractures and without vertebral fractures, right? We age match them, as you can see, you know, why 85% of them are Caucasian, the reason for that, 80% are African American, and then they have similar uh, bone mass index. And then normally when you diagnose who has osteoporosis, have risk of fracture, you're doing a called DEXA, okay? Measure the bone uh, mineral density. And then it's an area, it's not, it's two dimensional, right? So you can see, we know those uh, people has spine fracture, but you can see the fracture one versus control, the lumbar BMD in here, RS, they actually are not different. Also majority of score actually are above 0.25, because 0.25 are classified as osteoporosis, the T-score. So even so, those people do not necessarily have osteoporosis, they have osteopenia, but they still, you know, do not, you know, they have fractures and also the bone density measurement cannot, cannot differentiate whether they have fracture or not, right? So if you look at the HRPQC, that's the control sample at the left and the vertebral fracture patient at the right, and then you can, as I mentioned, you can perform in the ITS, taking the trabeculate bone compartment, and they also can analyze the cortical as well. So for the trabeculate bone analysis, we're showing here plate is green, rod in, in red. So by just looking at them, suddenly in the fractured side, you have more rod, right? You have more red in here. And quantify them indeed, right? There are significant reduction in the fracture group uh, with, you know, plate, and rod, uh, bone worm fraction, PVDB, and then in both radius and the, and, 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 and the tibia. And if you calculate it, we call it plot, plot, you know, PR ratio, play to versus rod ratio, then they can significantly have a reduction in the play to rod ratio, especially in the tibia. So therefore that means there is a transition loss in plates 
and then they actually uh, do transition from plates to rock, right? And then you also lost in the area bone form, form fraction. That's actually very interesting because as I mentioned before, the axial bone, bone aligned in that direction really determines the mechanical properties here. And then if you look at what the mechanism loss turned out, you lost him by significant number of plates. So P, T, B, N, that's number of plates. And then you also lost him the connections that's called the PP junctions, PR junctions, R junctions. So the loss is by Trebekah number and also connectivities. And then the consequence in here is the loss in, in the Trebekah stiffness, how much it, how strong the Trebekah bone is, and the whole bone stiffness. So therefore, with combination, computation, as well as the technology, we are able to identify what the, the you know, the significant difference, much more sensitive than the, uh, uh, than the you know, than the, the density measurement. So in summary, in the osteoporosis factor, we are going to summarize, in general, it's loss of Trebekah plate, loss of extra trabeculite, and then you have plate rod conversion, right? And they also loss in a trabecular connectivity. So let me go to the other issues we're working on the lab, but that's actually most uh, in the past uh, uh, 80 years, is working on osteoarthritis. As I mentioned, you know, we, you know, there was a recent biological study showing you know, for example, in ACL tear, those patients will have early osteoarthritis, and then the first thing that happens is bone resorption. So how the bone resorption initially leads into eventually the, a lot of bones in there is not understandable, right? And then so we begin to apply our technique in the uh, subcontral bone, means the bone underneath the cartilage, right? So showing here on the right is a result for feminine, which we talked about before, right? And you can see this is a distribution of a rod versus a plate. You can see the rod on the top here is most of them is transverse directions. And in the bottom here, the plate mostly is the longitudinal direction. And then also want you to pay attention to the numbers we're showing here, right? These are thousands, you know, 25,000. These are 6,000. So therefore, in the femoral neck, you have many, many more plates than the rods, right? It's, more, it's plate dominant. So looking at the left side is really the, the subconscious bone underneath the knee, the tibia, right, in here. And then the rod distribution is very similar. They are actually, most of them are transverse directions. And if one plays, and you can see there was a predominantly in the longitudinal direction, that also there's one close to transverse direction, also have another kind of, you know, uh, peak around there. So therefore, it looks like there is like a, the hammer has two humps. And also I want to point to you to the numbers in here. In here, the rod is about 1,000 and plate is 400. So therefore, subconscious bone is different from the femoral neck or from spine because they are more rod and then they have less plate. And then the plate distribution maybe have some unique features in here. So as I mentioned before, the early study we have done is taking some images from China. And now we actually have done our own studies and uh, you know, we just need to write them up as well. It's, this is a, doing the, the total knee replacement, you can take in the tibia plateau cutting off in here, right? Showing here in the medium side, you can see almost no cartilage. And then on the lateral side, actually the mild, and then you can see that you have uh, uh, some shining cartilage in there, right? And then you can, we can scan them and then we're gonna study those subregions in here. Right, and this is a, a cross section picture of the micro CT images you have after section. So you can see on top it's control samples, normal, we call them normal. Okay, and then the bottom one is always sample here. Once again, you can see on the medium side, there was a lot of bones in here, right? And then even though this is, this is X ray, X CT, but you can also see the shadows of cartilage, right? On top of here, you can see there's a cartilage really distributed nicely in here. And so therefore in here, definitely in the medium side, you know, they almost lost complete cartilage. But interesting, on the right side, which is the lateral side, and then they are not normal, okay? Absolutely not normal because you see the right side here is a thing going up, that's called osteophytes. And then you can see the subconscious plate here is not normal because it we call subconscious plate fracture because they lost something that have fracture here, right? And then, but they actually have four thickness. You can see here, the cartilage actually have four thickness here, even though they're not all normal. If you look at the bone, subconscious bone here, apparently they're not too much difference in here, right? And then indeed, you know, if we take in those uh, lateral side and then you do histology, classify their uh, cartilage integrity, 
you can see those uh, regions, external, anterior, posterior, they actually look normal. Okay, compared to the histology here. So if you do a scoring here, those areas actually are not necessarily have OA, right? So therefore, there's not significant different from the control samples in here. So we're going to focus on this area, and then to look at the measurements we have. So you can see these are traditional measurements we have. You know, if you look at bone one fraction in those one, they have a uh, intact. Uh, cartilage thickness and the bone warm fraction is now different. And then in here, I'm also reporting the plate bone warm fraction is different. So that's where the troubles are happening here in the past, right? And then a shaded area here is actually those places they do classify as OA. But in the meantime, they have differences in bone warm fraction. They also have differences in plate bone. Warm. I don't want to, you know, uh, you play focus on that. Want to focus on in OA sample, but the cartilage is intact. Right. So therefore, when you have OA, you look at the bone and cartilage, they either have I mean, the previous technology is showing you either have bone density change, you have OA, or you do not have a bone density change, you don't have OA. Right. So therefore, that's why it is difficult to figure out which one is first. But because we now separate the plate and rod, Right, so therefore you can see now, and then if you look at the mechanical properties, sorry, if you look at the mechanical properties, they're also in these regions normal, they do not have different. But now we, because we separate them in the plate and rod, so therefore you can see now, they actually, even though they looks normal, bone one fraction is normal, but uh, they actually have significant low rod bone one fraction in the OA group. And then the PR ratio has been changed. So the plated rod ratio has increased significantly in the OA samples, right? Even though you cannot measure by the traditional bone uh, measurements here. And then the loss of rod bone one fraction is by the bottom here is number of rod. Rod number has been significantly decreased. It looks normal, but because of this uh, ITS, we would have shown that, right? And then the reason not to show uh, there was differences in bone one fraction because when you lost in the rod, the remaining rods actually become thicker, right? You can see that you are significantly increase of rod numbers. That's why not the, if you just measure how much bone volume fraction they have in here, they're not able to pick up by that. Now, if you look at the medium side, everywhere is osteoarthritis. You know, the score is all different. And of course, now the bone volume fraction shows up now is very, very different. And then the plate bone volume fraction is very, very much different. The other plate bone volume fraction here. And then the mechanical properties over the roof, over the roof here. And now, interesting, most rod bone one fraction still lower in OA, very consistently in the normal we're having here. Of course, the ratio between the plate rod, uh, rod ratio is going up the roof, can be three times, two times, you know, quite a different. And then the deficit in the rod number is still remain the same, right? You can see, you can see they're still in the OA sample, they have less of a the number of density and the thickness, you know, the remaining trabecular plates and remaining rod, they become thicker because you lost in the rod, the remaining rods have to grow thicker because they still have some mechanical forces in here, right? So that's our cross section study that, you know, these, these end stage ones here. So therefore, we have the new hypothesis. Maybe the loss of rod bone one fraction actually occurs earlier. In uh, in OA, right? So we, this one is supported by a guinea pig models, and then those nice looking guinea pigs you have, and then they actually unfortunately develop OAs osteoarthritis in four months and five months. So in here we look at the you know three months. You can three months they cartilage is normal. So second month, the three months they're normal, right? But if you look at using the ITS analysis, you can see in the second month and the third month, we really identify the actually a loss rod in here. So therefore we have a new hypothesis right now is the OA could come from initial loss. You can see, you know, the, in subconscious bone, you have a very nice distribution rod, most of the rods, some are placed, and for somehow you lost in the rod. When you lost in the rod, and then when you lost them, they're gone. You cannot really make them happen again. And then to remain because of mechanical loading, so the, the plate becomes thicker and thicker. Eventually, they're so thick, you can show here schematically, and then the cost and distribution changes in the cartilage and then leading to loss of cartilage. And then the loss of cartilage increases the bone, so you have the virtual cycle going on. So that's a new hypothesis we have right now. 
And then in order to test them, you need to really do study. So the new version of HLP plus D, if you're not too tall, if you're not too heavy, like me, and then you actually can stuck your legs in there, you can actually scan your knee, right? So that is one is my knee, right? You can see, I can, you can scan the femur, you can see the tibia, and then you can look at the really nicely high resolution here, right? Therefore, you can identify your regions you want to study in the tibia as well as in the radius. So we begin some studies, look at one of the disease is, and one of the injury have is ACL tear. So in ACL tear, more than 50% of these people will develop a early osteoarthritis in 10 years, right? And then we know before it's a loss in bones. You can see we have these people immediately after ACL injury. And then, you know, roughly one month later before the surgery. And another one is one month after the surgery replacement, okay? You can see during that period of time, you lost in amount of bone wall infections. And the plate bone wall infection remained the same. And then indeed, as observing here, using this technique, we identify that you are lost in the rods initially, and also the plate rod ratio has been changed, right? So therefore we have some evidence suggesting those early changes, even though it's very subtle, but that they're actually causing fundamental structure changes in here, right? So I want to summarize this essence of trivagative bone is trivagative plates is just a bunch of plates and rods, trivagative bone. And then the plate and axial trivagative are very important. In general, the supporting mechanical load. And then in OA, if it's too much plates, too much is strong in axial one, they cause a non-uniform distribution in trivagative bone. So this ITS morphology is really providing a morphological and biomedical mechanism as well for us under the structure. And then in osteoporosis, you have plate loss, plate to rod conversion, and reduced connectivity. In osteoarthritis, you're lost in rod, sticking in plate, but also have reduced uh, connectivity. So too little, too much in bone microstructure are not good. So I'm going to talk about, I think I have the people ask me question, you know, why you have plates? Where does the plates come from? Uh, and, and I was never to able to answer them several years ago. So one of the things I mentioned before is that bone is alive to respond to mechanical loading, right? So therefore, you know, how to quantify the mechanical loading and able to quantify stress strain is a challenging biomechanics problem. And also in the cell level, how to respond to what's the mechanism is fascinating, right? So therefore in our laboratory, we have doing animal studies, we have done uh, experiment studies with those single cells that really center around to try to answer these questions. And then before we get into some measurements, we're going to introduce how bone is formed, right? This bone dynamics. So the two process going on in bone. One is called remodeling, is you resorbing bone, form is a formation following resorption on the same surface. This happens every day because that's where regular bone maintenance to usually balanced and then make sure you actually always have new bone. So the old bone will replace by new bone, right? And then another process we call the modeling but it's not a model model, it's a modeling process, right? Those are either be uncoupled formation, just like a, just formation, there's no result before, and uncoupled resorption. We call them anabolic and catabolic because catabolic is lost in one here. In before, people in general believe that's doing the growth and development. You can see right now we actually deserve it. You know, it's going to be not, not that true. And you can see both mechanisms can lead into bone loss by modeling or and by remodeling. And both mechanisms can also lead into bone gain as well. You can see if you have catabolic modeling, you have, you have a lot of bone loss. If you're remodeling, you're making bone less than what you resolve, you have bone loss as well. So, but that's a very important thing to right here. So we want to determine these questions, where and how much bone is formed and resolved in response to mechanology, especially interesting whether it's on plates and rods, right? And then the second one is what mechanism? whether it's a modeling and remodeling, because I'm not going to go to detail, but what it means is this actually relate to the bone biology behind it. This modern process and remodeling process are just different bone biology here. So we're using these mice uh, tibia loading animal models, and then we apply line in mechanical loading to the right leg and the left leg as long load control, and then we do the loading for five days a week, and then we actually do many, many more weeks here. And then in order to quantify the, you know, I, we're actually going to use in the micro CT as a way to quantify the bone form. So therefore we actually do a lot of uh, the scans. We do weekly scans. You know, this week one is where we'll start the mechanical loading and then loading them for five weeks. And then we, you know, and then do another scan in six weeks. 
And so you can see we're starting minus one, zero, and all the way to six weeks. So we have a weekly scan and we will measure one in tubercle bone shown here, also can quantify the one in cortical bone, right? And then what we do is we will have so many different weeks and then we do a registration. We, reg we put them all in a fixed coordinate system and register them. And then by comparing each week by the images, you can actually quantify in red a bone disappear result. And also bone gained in green is form, right? So form formation and result between all the weeks in the same coordinate system. And then because we can track in every week, so now by tracking the bone box for three weeks, and then you can actually define what kind of bone is the form, right? So if you see there was a background, background suddenly have bone formation, that's anabolic modeling because you're adding bone from nowhere, right? And then if I have resorption, become background, the third week is still background, they're gone. So the kind of body modeling. And another one is if we see resorption in one week, because background means stop. And then the third week that you have bone formation, that's a remodeling. Okay, actually I need it. Actually, it should be just remodeling, not remodeling, modeling. All right. Uh, and then this one showing the example here. And then, you know, in this location, you can see there's nothing here, nothing here, suddenly have greens in there. So that's anabolic modeling. And then in here, you see one of the tuberculi, the resolved, and then it's actually completely gone. It's catabolic modeling. And then here, you have surface, it's resolved, becomes smaller, but then actually come back with the following weeks of bone formation. So therefore, you can separate the bone formation and resorption here. So this is just looking at a representative pictures you have here. Left side is unloaded. Uh, right, right side is loaded. So th definitely you have more patches going on in color, right? In, in the blue and the, in the yellow. That means a new bone formation. You can see that you have much more yellows in the loaded one and some in the, uh, in the, in the blue, that's in the one, right? If we quantify them, indeed, in the anabolic modeling, first week, second week, three week, and four, uh, four week. And you can see the significant plate uh, you, you know, significant bone formation by anabolic modeling on plates, but not on the rod, right? So that's what it is. When we can loading them, they're actually adding anabolic uh, bone, new bones in the plate, not on the rod. And then you can separate, you can separate them into different orientations. And the very interesting, you know, in axial oblique transverse, right? I think that we can loading is axial direction. And then interestingly, in all the axial plate, you have a bone from, you know, formations and then in the you know transverse one also significant some in the transverse one is also significant but in terms of play rod right you don't see too much you know adding new bones in here but you do have some in the transverse direction okay in the transverse direction so transverse rod even overall rod is not increased but the transverse rod you add in new bones in here so therefore you add a lot of plates in here Every directions, a lot of them is in the axis direction where you apply mechanical loading, right? And same thing for remodeling, you can see here, remodeling, most remodeling is added in the plate, you can see here, significant, and not too much overall in the rod. If So that's very much related to mechanical loading, right? Because mechanical loading can see the axial plates, axial rod, uh, axial rod, they actually subject to significant loading in the, Compressive, uh, compressive uh, loading on them here. Okay, and then there are plates that have more axial one than the transverse and oblique. Okay, and in the rod, actually, it's interesting. You know, there's not too much difference in terms of tensile stress and tensile strains. But in the rod, you can see they actually in the transverse one they receiving uh, significant tensile strain as well. So, right, and so um, so therefore seems the Mechanical loading, compressive loading in the plates driven to the bone formation in the plate, in X plate. And then the tensile uh, strain in the transverse rods may activate in bone formation in some rod, but majority bone formation is at plate. So therefore the plate rod is made by, because of they have different mechanical loading here. So in some rise, the increase the anabolic modeling and remodeling targeting plate like tubercular and also transverse raw like tubercular. So the anabolic modeling actually is three quarter and the remodeling one quarter account of the mechanical induced tubercular. So now you can see modeling and remodeling, not just doing, rather not just doing the growth, but actually a process going on here. And then catabolic modeling are not reflected by mechanical loading. So 
let me end up with a fun project uh, with a study bone, right? I kind of mentioned you know, a little before in the vertebral structure, you identify more than 85% of patients actually are Caucasians, right? And it, it, indeed, they actually are raised uh, differences between who is going to have fracture, right? So if you normalize Caucasian white by risk for fracture at 100%, uh, you can see the Chinese about 30% relative to risk in here. And then interestingly, Koreans and Japanese are falling between, even though we are very close to each other, right? So therefore, Asians have a low risk. And if you look at African-American, they are probably all down the way in here, the much low have a risk of factor here. So early on, we did a study many years ago now, is uh, taking a premenopausal woman and looking at their uh, bone structure. So in general, you know, the uh, Chinese are short, 12% shorter and 11% uh, less weight. And we did the HRP to see on that. And then when the results come back, it's really quite interesting for us. So we did it in the tibia, in the radius, in terms of the plate and rod segmentation. As we presented here, green are plates, red are rods. You can see in the Chinese, you have a lot of greens than the one on the white, on the Caucasians on the left side, right? If you quantify them, indeed, they have similar rod bone one fraction, but they played bone one fraction in yellow in Chinese in here is double the amount in the Caucasian in white in here. And also almost double is actual bone one fraction. And then same in the radius, same in the tibia, right? And then they are by numbers. Therefore the Chinese women have significant play like trabecula in the structure. And those translating in significant dramatic difference between the mechanical property, right? So you can see the modulus is almost double from uh, the Chinese, uh, the mechanical property of the Chinese is double the amount than in the Caucasians. And so therefore they may explain you know, why the Chinese women have low risk of osteoporosis fractures. And then now we including all ages, right? And then very, very interesting, you know, uh, independent of all the factors. And then it turns out we can just look at the bones can able to differentiate in Chinese from Caucasians, right? Play the rod ratio, differentiate Chinese. And then if you play the rod ratio less than 0.66, 86 of them correctly identify them as white. And if play the rod ratio greater than 1.3, and we identify correctly 81% of them are Chinese. And then the ROC curve, you know, is actually 0 0.78, 80. So that's a very good predictor in terms of tell who is Chinese, who is Caucasian, right? So I want to do the studies ongoing is a study in China because it's getting me interested in regional ethnic differences in the different groups in China. And they will still want to do the study in China, in the US, but we have not able to do that. It's looking at American born versus China born and also looking at how the loss in the bones in the, uh, during the period of menopause. And then it's getting my interest in genetics and the anthropology here, right? I want to go back to this one, right? White have much higher risk than Chinese, but it's interesting Korean and Japanese distributing here, right? And then now we know where everybody come from. We all come from Africa. All the Asians already come from Africa, right? And then there was several mi migration. The yellow one is a little earlier. It's about 10 to 20,000 years ago. And those are people, you know, they last of ice ages to walk to Japan, yellow in here, they settled in there, they become Japanese. And the second wave probably more than 5,000 years ago, that's really the people end up in here in blue or Korean. But you can see they are within 10 percent, you know, 20,000 years. And then Koreans about, you know, less than 10,000, maybe 6,000 years of history. And then you can see, well, pretty close to each other. You can identify people in here and how the Koreans, Japanese and Chinese bone risk will be different. I think I'm very fascinated in here. My hypothesis is the bone structure different. So we're not there yet. But if you go into red arrows in here, this is also from China. And then they are very close to Caucasians. The reason of them is that there are 86% of the genes is the Caucasian, they're Uyghurs. So the, the minority group in here, in this Northwest territory of China, they have multi-race in this uh, province called uh, you know, Xinjiang, but also have a lot of Uyghurs we call in here. So they are unique population. I want to do the study. I want to compare them to the regular Chinese folks in, in, in China. Difficult to get people to study here. So I, I'm pitching a dream to them. So if you build it, they will come. So I say, I'm going to build a multidisciplinary genetic medicine institute. And then we do independent disciplinary groups. 
recruiting patients, genetic typing, demographic characteristics. I'm studying bone microstructure, doing osteoarthritis, and other people doing cardiovascular disease and cancer can do. Not too many people do answer my call. So finally, I decided I need to go there. You know, I really need to bring the measurements to the patients. So therefore, I able to convince somebody to give me money to build a super duper RV thing here, and then the RV here, and then you know I have a living quarters, and they have CT thing here, I have a bone density measurement here, and then the the, the, the trailer can extend. So therefore, I can have people sitting here, working here. The, sorry, I apologize. The in Chinese. And that, that's the one you will build up in here. You can see here, that's the, the trailer. And then inside you have these HRPQ CDs in here and they're pretending I'm driving, but I cannot drive those trucks yet. But hopefully next, uh, in two years, I could do my sabbaticals in there, I can do that. And then I send my students a sheet back after COVID. That's where, that's the trailer was sitting in the China now. And then that's where she's sitting. We have a meeting to talk about one here. So we're pretty exciting. And it got me very interested in the bone microstructure, right? I told you can differentiate into uh, Chinese versus uh, ca Caucasians. And they can also use in the strong structure to differentiate with a different species of, um, of uh, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, the apes, right? So you can see if you do an analysis, it can separate in, you know, humans and uh, chimpanzee and uh, gorilla and so on and so forth. And then the ITS actually can second it out. That's quite interesting by bone microstructure. So if you look at it here, that's our anthropology doing, right? What they're looking. So they can shape of your teeth and they're able to separate China, the separating, a, you know, the Chinese, not Chinese, and uh, humans versus gorilla versus uh, you know, chimpanzee and pangos here. So got to be very interested. And come back to here is, I think the, you have microstructure differences in disease and different race. This probably also at the end also coming by the mechanical biology because the mechanical biology actually driven what kind of plates and rod they're gonna have, right? So therefore going in a circle, we're interested in this revolution and the mechanical loading here. And indeed it's quite interesting, you know, as I say, fish have very dense bones when they begin to uh, frog and the mice, they begin to lose in bones. If you want to fly, you have less bones. And then the mammals going back, decided going back to the ocean, then they actually have reverse process. They now actually able to gain bone back. So therefore how the different um, genetics, different anthropology and the related to bone microstructure is actually quite interesting for me. I'm going to end up my faculty in focus talking here. Thanks for my collaborators and my student. Uh, and uh, thank you for spending Friday uh, morning with me. I'm going to stop sh sharing. And uh, if you have questions, happy to answer any question you may have. You may have, maybe there are no questions here. Lisa, so, back to you. Yes, I right now there are no questions. And um, so, but I, I have one question that um, it seemed, and maybe you'll say, no, you heard that wrong, but it seemed to me like um, in disease state or when, um, there was development of uh, bone disease, people would uh, have more plates, like they lose rods and they their plates would thicken. So that's sort of bad and that would lead perhaps to osteoarthritis yeah. because things get sort of thrown out of whack. Yeah. But at the same time, the, um, the Chinese women had more plates. Yeah. So is it sort of safe to say that if you sort of naturally have more plates, that's a good thing, but if if you're aging and things are deteriorating and then you get more plates, then that's a bad thing. So it isn't no. necessarily a good thing to have more plates. No, it's, I think it depends where you're adding plates. You need a strategic adding in correct directions. So, and then, so it is true. So uh, if you look at the, the distribution of uh, whole population, and in general, the people have very low density, they have risk of osteoporosis, process, they have good cartilage, they don't have uh, OA. And for the people who actually have good bones, they actually have tendency to have uh, OA. So that one is clear. But unfortunately, there are also significant people in the middle, uh, and they have uh, good bones, reasonable bones, and then they actually can develop in both OA and also process because of location, right? They may develop OA in the knee, but they actually, they, they, you know, kind of have a osteoporosis factor in the spine. So I think there are also some people, my friends that, uh, you know, uh, Tommy's racing uh, 
raising uh, his hand. <laughs> so yeah. as our faculty, we probably uh, Alexis allow uh, Tommy to uh, to to, uh, to talk. Oh, elevate him to uh, as a panelist. <laughs> or I can read his question. It's uh, you can see it at it's in the yeah. chat. Okay. Hey Tommy, you can. You yes, can... I, I Ed, I enjoyed that very much. Um, I was just thinking of other things, you know, with with genetics. Um, of course, you're familiar with some of the 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 our relations, close relations to Neanderthal and Denisovan, yeah. um, and those components and, and oh. different amount mixes within uh, Eurasian populations that uh, might have influence. But I was more curious about uh, diet and and latitude. Yeah. Or yeah. some kind of sunshine vitamin D that you would yeah uh Tommy I think uh, the diet one I think uh you know diet one we cannot get rid of them because the Chinese no matter where we go <laughs> we, we, we love Chinese food um environmental will probably answer that question because this study you know we have done the studies compared to Chinese in Hong Kong and also the Chinese in Australia, the results are the same. So for example, actually published paper already is compared to Caucasians in Australia, Caucasian, the Chinese in, uh, in Australia, the results almost superimpose each other. But the Chinese are, you know, at least the first generation, maybe the second generation, we love to eat the Chinese most of the most, most time. Uh, so that one we need to teach on. That's why we actually want to do the studies in the US is looking at, uh, you know, the, uh, China born Chinese and also American born Chinese, and especially several generations later, right, to see whether there's any difference in here. So, and then the genetics, I think is related to the vitamin D mutations. Is uh, we well know the African American, their body are not sensitive to any deficiency in vitamin D. They can have terrible vitamin D level, but they are fine, at least in bone, we know that. And about the Caucasians, the vitamin D deficiency causing a lot of trouble. I mean, in bone side, it's really, really bad for lots of bones. I think it could be. That's just like if we want to do this study, you know, do uh, enough studies, analyze the genes to see whether that it show up in these gene-wise uh, studies. Is when we, you know, when the Caucasians evolve going to the north, and then they struggling getting sunshine to get vitamin Ds. So therefore. The light skin one survived because they're stronger. The muscle is stronger, everything stronger, right? Then the made in all the functions really depends on that advantage. I think that's what happens. Yeah, I think that's my wide hypothesis may relate to vitamin D, but uh, I need to do that study in China. So I'm still working on it uh, to try to get my some colleagues interested in China. We were able to do this study. So um, we're just about to wrap up. I have one last quick question about yeah. your van. Yeah. Will you also do blood testing in there? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So you'll yeah. get some of this information. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're getting either either saliva or blood. You mean? Uh -huh. Mostly right now we don't want the blood because we, we don't have people to. Uh, you need, need a nurse. Right. <laughs> a bunch of graduate students. So therefore, do a swab is okay. So we, uh -huh. we focus on swab first. So. Uh, it was delayed, absolutely delayed by COVID. So we had a lunch. We're supported by Columbia Global uh, Fund. They give us a planning grant and then went, and then we launched these uh, initiatives uh, in December of 2019. <laughs> so we immediately wanted the COVID. And then I was able to set up my student in there. And then right now it's really figure out the logistics and figure out the IRBs. And because, you know, and they also, uh, figure out that uh, you, know, uh, you know driving the van to different places make sure everything's still working so that's actually a big test that we have in here because you're moving a equipment to different locations make sure that it will work that's not guaranteed yeah right no it's it's really exciting and ambitious it's cool that's my plan when uh, <laughs> in a couple of years and then we're stepping down the chair and then I intend to do my sabbatical thing they're really setting up this study it's fun. Yeah. Well, if you need a help, helper, I'll come. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'd love to have my friends and colleagues travel with me. And uh, because yeah. my, that's why I was getting a driver's license driving that truck in China. And uh -huh. then, uh, then I really want to just, you know, go to the steps in Mongolia, 
go to these exotic places and then park my minivan, not minivan, park my RVs in there. We can actually, you know, shoot in some, uh, uh, you know, deers or wolves, whatever. And then, <laughs> wow. yeah, in the meantime, we're actually also getting sun stuff. So it's, uh, it's my dream and, and I intend to achieve that dream. That's why I call the farm project. Yeah, no, it's it's great. Good sabbatical project. Yeah, because I bet. So thanks for so many people to join this link. And this is starting of a new series of uh, BME faculty in focus. And then I hope my colleagues in our department can join this. And then we'll be on YouTube and then we we'll periodically update, hopefully in a couple of years. I'm going to update this uh, video such that we have results of our exciting studies. Not you know in my you know other study research as well as this uh, we call the uh, uh, Silk Road Silk Road project that's what I call it. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for uh, listening and uh, have a great weekend. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Alexa. Thanks, Tommy. Yeah. Bye. Have a good weekend.